Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to day one, session three, complex generics, complex injectables, ophthalmic and optic products. My name is Wen Lei Jiang. I'm a senior science advisor at Office of Research and Standards, Office of Generic Drugs. Today, I will present advances in iron chloride products, product specific guidance discussion. After this presentation, I hope you can list different iron complex products to treat iron deficiency and which ones have generics available. You can describe different iron species in vivo after infusion of iron complex products and understand their respective roles. There have been challenges to directly measure drug bound iron in vivo for several decades. An analytical method was developed for direct measurement of drug bound iron in a recent Gudufa project. After this presentation, I hope you can recognize the significant contributions of Gudufa research to product specific guidance development and discuss the major revision of the product specific guidance for iron complex products. Iron deficiency is the leading cause of anemia and is highly prevalent in patients with chronic heart failure, chronic kidney disease, or cancer. Iron deficiency can be treated with intravenous IV iron therapy. Currently, there are close to 10 iron complex injection products approved in the U.S., including ferromoxetol, ferric carboxyl models, previously named iron sucrose, sodium ferric gluconate, iron dextrin, now named as ferric oxyhydroxide products. In 2011, a generic sodium ferric gluconate became the first FDA-approved generic IV iron product. In January 2021, a generic ferromoxyl was approved. These iron complex products all consist of ferric oxyhydroxide core that is stabilized by a specific carbohydrate. Before we dive into how these iron complex products transport in vivo after IV administration, let's review some basic human iron physiology. Most of your body's iron is in the hemoglobin of your red blood cells which carries oxygen around your body, accounting for over 60% of total iron. Irons in tissues account for about uh, 40%. In the blood, there are irons bound to ferritin called ferritin bound iron, FBI. Irons bound to transferrin named as transferrin bound iron, TBI. Also, there are negligible amount of weakly bound to albumin, citrate, uh, these are called non-transferring bound iron, NTBI, or labile iron. In summary, serum total iron, TI, includes TBI plus FBI plus NTBI. TBI is at a much higher level than FBI and NTBI. Here, I listed some common ranges for these iron species. Another important term I want to refresh your memory is the total iron binding capacity, TIBC, which measures the total capacity of blood to bind and transport iron. This flowchart describes iron transport after infusion of iron complex drug product. Here, we call the iron complex drug product as drug bound iron, DBI. Upon infusion, iron chloride particles enter the systemic circulation and are uptaken by the RES system. Once internalized, iron particles are delivered to the lysosome an organelle responsible for degradation of biomolecules within the cell. 
iron ions from the colloid particle then become part of the intracellular labile iron pool and are available for use in biological processes. Iron can be bound to transferring to form DPI and transported in the body. If iron is not needed immediately, the cell stores it in the form of ferritin and hemosiderin. After IV infusion of iron complex products, besides previously mentioned TBI, FBI, and NTBI, there is a new species in the body that is drug-bound iron, DBI. A rapid influx of considerable amounts of iron can saturate circulating transference iron binding sites, and any excess iron is then present as labor iron, also called non-transferring bound iron, NTBI, in the plasma. Theoretically, NTBI is formed when the iron complex product is not stable or labor iron is released when transferring is saturated. The NTBI can be toxic as it is imported into cells via non-specific transporters where it can interact with oxygen to form reactive oxygen species. In 2013, OGD published a product-specific guidance for iron sucrose. This guidance recommends both in vitro and in vivo PK studies to demonstrate bioequivalence. For the in vivo study, a single dose randomized parallel PK study instead of a crossover study is recommended. The rationale for the parallel study is that iron storage and transport may be affected after the first administration of iron sucrose, and a long washout period may be needed to return to baseline in a crossover study. In addition, at that time, uh, no analytical method is available to distinguish drug-bound iron, DBI, from other iron species in vivo. Therefore, it is recommended to measure total iron and transferring bound iron in serum. Considering the amount of FBI and NTBI are relatively low, drug-bound iron, DBI, is estimated by subtracting the amount of TBI from TI. The bioequivalence is based on the maximum value of the difference in concentration between TI and TBI over all time points measured, and the difference in AUC between TI and TBI. Everyone can see this is not the best way to determine PK parameters of drug-bound iron. What if we can develop a bioanalytical method to directly measure drug-bound iron and other iron species in vivo? In addition, a large number of subjects are required in parallel study. What's the feasibility of conducting a crossover study with reasonable washout period? In addition, there are some in vitro release methods in place to determine labor iron level in iron complex product. Can we provide direct evidence to confirm generic products approved by current FDA criteria don't have higher NTBI level than the reference product in vivo. In 2014, FDA solicited research studies to evaluate iron species in healthy subjects treated with generic and reference sodium ferric glucanate. This grant was awarded to Dr. Sarah Michel and Dr. James Pauley from University of Maryland. The project started uh, in September 2014 and ended in April 2019. The objective is to conduct in vivo studies to compare plasma total iron, TI, transferring bound iron, TBI, non-transferring bound iron, NTBI levels, and oxidative stress after IV administration of reference and generic sodium ferric glucanate injections in healthy subjects.
There are six specific aims listed. Here, uh, the text highlighted in blue is the focus of today's presentation. That is, develop bioanalytical methods to determine different iron species. Conduct a two-way crossover study to determine whether there are any significant differences between generic and reference in levels of NTBI and other iron species monitor TIBC and the ferritin levels to determine the appropriate washout period, monitor any side effects or adverse events in this study. Here are the project outcomes. First, the UMD team developed a size exclusion LC method coupled with inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry ICPMS for simultaneous measurements of drug bound iron DBI, transferrin bound iron TBI, albumin bound iron ABI, citrate bound iron CI. As shown in this table, there are large differences in molecular weight of these iron bound species. SEC separates them by size and importantly, preserves proteins in their native and metal-coordinated states. For the total iron, TI, it was measured by ICPMS without any separation. Here is a chromatogram. There is good baseline separation of DBI and CI from other iron species. Bound iron, PBI peak, include both albumin bound iron, ABI, and ferritin bound iron, FBI. PBI peak has some overlap with the PBI peak. These eluted iron species were collected and confirmed with other analytical methods, such as SDS page, for the protein molecular weight. As mentioned earlier, FBI and ABI peaks cannot be separated well. However, ABI level is estimated to be very low as albumin preferably binds to copper and zinc in vivo. Therefore, citrate iron level, CI measured here, can be approximated as NTBI level. For the first time, Drug bound iron can be directly measured along with other iron species in biologic fluid. If you want to know more details about this analytical method, please refer to this publication. Next, I'm going to present the clinical study to compare levels of NTBI and other iron species between reference and a generic sodium ferrical glucanate. This is a randomized, open-label, single-dose, two-way, two-period crossover study. The washout period is at least four weeks. Intensive PK sampling were conducted to obtain PK profiles for different iron species. At around day 14, after administration of iron complex injection, 12 volunteers provided plasma to assess the TIBC and the ferritin level to help determine if iron storage and transport return to the baseline and to determine what is the appropriate washout period. There were 44 subjects who completed the study and their uh, plasma sample were obtained at all time points. However, nine subjects were excluded due to infusion rate dosing errors and red blood cell hemolysis. Data from 35 participants were usable. There was an even distribution of females and males. Ages of female and males were also similar. This table here listed the lowest limit of quantitation for different iron species. These two figures uh, plot the average PK profiles of TI, DBI, TBI, 
CI after brand and generic infusions. Statistic comparison was also conducted for DBI, TBI, TI, and NTBI between test and reference. All are within BE limits of 80 to 125%. During the study, there were 108 AEs that, that ranged from definitely associated to the study drug and or study procedures to not associated to the study drug and or study procedures. 71 AEs temporarily associated with brand study arm, 32 AEs temporarily associated with generic study arm, and five AEs associated with neither brand nor generic study arms, that is, occurred before any study drug administration. This slide shows a plot of individual plasma concentrations of ferritin and TIBC in 12 subjects at different times during the clinical trial. Each participant is represented by a separate colored line. For ferritin, it took 28 days, uh, that is at least uh, more than 14 days, to return to the baseline after first infusion of iron complex product. For TIBC, there is not much change during the study period. This data suggests that 14 to 28 day seems to be a reasonable washout period in a crossover B study of iron complex product. In summary, this research project helped develop a LC-ICP-MS method for the first time to directly measure the drug-bound iron in vivo. No significant differences were observed between generic and the brand sodium ferric glucanate in TI, TBI, DBI, and NTBI levels. 14 to 28 days seems to be a reasonable washout period in a crossover B study for iron complex products based on observed ferritin and TIBC levels. These research outcomes provided additional options for bioequivalent study design of iron complex products. Recently, there is active ingredient name change for iron complex products. As stated in FDA's May 26, 2021 CITEM petition response, ferric oxyhydroxide is responsible for the pharmacologic activity and is thus the active ingredient. Sucrose and starches are merely excipients providing stability and processing functions. In the orange book, the API name for these products are all changed to ferric oxyhydroxide. The next speaker, Dr. Yi Wei Li, will discuss more on this. Here is the updated product-specific guidance for ferric oxyhydroxide NDA21135, previously known as iron sucrose. I highlighted the major revisions in yellow. First, the active ingredient name changed to ferric oxyhydroxide. Second, the study can be either parallel or crossover design. Third, as of analyzed to measure, an option to directly measure drug bound iron is added and the bioequivalence limits can be based on iron in ferric oxyhydroxide colloids in serum. Here comes the final summary slide. There are multiple innovator iron complex products on the market, but with limited generics available. There were significant challenges to establish by equivalence of iron complex products. In the past several years, Significant advancements were made in bioanalytical method development and bioequivalent study design of iron complex products. 
University of Maryland team developed an LC ICP MS method to directly measure the drug bound iron in vivo for the first time. No significant differences were observed between generic and the reference product in TI, TBI, DBI, and NTBI levels. 14 to 28 days seemed to be a reasonable washout period in a crossover B study for iron complex products based on observed ferritin and TIBC levels. Based on these research findings, the product specific guidance for ferric oxyhydroxide injection was updated accordingly and just published last week. This is a great example how GDUFA research outcome is translated to guidance development. Finally, I would like to thank Dr. Sarah Michel, Dr. James Pauley, and their teams for their efforts on this project and the remarkable contributions to the PSG development. This project is supported by grant U01 FD005266. Next comes the fun time for challenging questions. The first question is, iron in the form of chloride ferric oxyhydroxide in serum cannot be directly measured. Is this statement true or false? The correct answer is B, false. The second challenge question, which of the following statement is true? A, the in vivo B study design of ferric oxyhydroxide may be parallel or crossover. B, the in vivo B study design of ferric oxyhydroxide can only be parallel. The correct answer is A. If you have any question, please write them down. Uh, we can discuss more at the panel session. Thank you for your attention. I will pass the podium to the next speaker, Dr. Yi Wei Li. Thank you for the introduction and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yi Wei Li. I'm from the Office of Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Assessment in the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. The title of my presentation is Advanced in Iron Core Product Quality Considerations When Conducting Comparability Studies. It is my pleasure to be here today and to share some thoughts on the iron core drug products in support of ANDA applications. Uh, let's take a look at the learning objectives. At the end of this presentation, we will have covered discussions on how to use comparability studies to establish and demonstrate sameness in physical chemical properties between generic and reference iron core product. And we can apply quality considerations when we design and conduct the comparability studies. Here is a outline of the presentations. We will have a quick introduction of the iron core drug products. We will spend a few minutes discussing the definition of the active ingredients for a few iron core drug products and uh, uh, FDA product specific guidance. Uh, the main part of my presentation will be on quality considerations when conducting comparability studies. At the end of the presentation, I will provide a summary and a couple of challenge questions. Uh, for today's uh, discussion, uh, we will focus on injectable iron core drug products for the treatment of iron deficiency anemia. Uh, here I uh, highlight two important words, injectable and anemia. Uh, there are other iron-based drug products that are maybe of uh, different dosage forms or for uh, different uh, disease treatments. Uh, they are not the subject of today's discussions. Uh, iron core drug products are complex drug products. Uh, the common features of the products include polynuclear iron core based uh, on ferric oxyhydroxide or iron oxide ionic networks. Uh, the iron core is stabilized by a carbohydrate shell 
and the products contain uh, nano-sized particles. Upon injection, it is believed that the nano-sized particles are picked up uh, via endocytic uh, routes. Uh, they are further processed and repackaged into hemoglobin to treat anemia. Uh, there are two known adverse effects for this type of drug products, hypersensitivity reactions such as anaphylaxis and oxidative stress caused by uh, low molecular weight ion species. This slide shows uh, the approved iron core drug products on the U.S. market. Uh, in the first column on the left, you see the three names of the innovator products. The second column provides uh, the non-proprietary names. Uh, please note that the names listed here are pre-June 2021 names. Uh, in the next couple of slides, we will provide uh, further discussions about the recent change. Uh, in the third and fourth columns from the left, uh, the current RD uh, applicants and the approved dates for the U.S. market are provided. Uh, you can see the most recent approval at the bottom um, is uh, monopheric, uh, approved in 2020. In the last column on the right, the measured particle sizes are uh, provided. As discussed before, iron core drug products contain nanoparticles, and the particle size ranges from 8 nanometer to 24 nanometer. Uh, currently, there are two approved generic iron core drug products. Uh, sodium ferric gluconate injection was approved in 2011, and at the beginning of this year, generic uh, ferromoxetol injections was approved. Now, um, let's uh, spend a few minutes discussing a recent change uh, in a uh, May 2021 response to a citizen petition, FDA clarifies that ferric oxyhydroxide unit is considered the active ingredient for a number of iron core drug products. Uh, the drug products affected by the response are highlighted in yellow, and they include iron dextrin injection, sodium ferric gluconate injection, and iron sucrose injection. Uh, these products uh, have a ferric oxyhydroxide core stabilized by sugar moiety, uh, the sugar moieties uh, uh, such as dextrin or sucrose are considered excipients, uh, providing stability and processing uh, functions. So on the left side of this slide, a uh, descriptive image of ferric oxyhydroxide uh, network and its interactions with sodium uh, mole uh, with the sucrose molecules are provided. Uh, highlighted by the blue circle, uh, you can see the ferric oxyhydroxide monomer unit. Uh, this unit repeats itself throughout the iron core network and is considered by FDA as the active ingredient for the drug product. This slide has already been uh, presented by Wenlei in her uh, presentation. Uh, it provides a list of drug products that are affected uh, by the active ingredients name change uh, in 2021. Uh, in this slide, you can see the old name the current active ingredients, the new proprietary name, and their corresponding NDA numbers, as well as the uh, uh, manufacturers. Uh, now, um, I, I recognize that it will take some time for everyone to get used to the new naming system. Uh, however, from quality standpoints, the name change should not affect uh, or change the approaches that we take uh, to evaluate the comparability uh, between the generic and innovative drugs. Um, in fact, uh, there should not uh, be any changes in terms of how one uh, determines or characterizes the physical chemical properties of the iron core drug products. Uh, with that, uh, let's take a closer look at the FDA uh, product specific guidance. Um, as one lay has shown, uh, two B studies are required to demonstrate by equivalence uh, between test product and RLD one in vivo study and one in vitro particle size distribution study. In addition to the B studies, there are also special considerations. Uh, for example, the proposed generic drug product should be qualitatively and quantitatively the same as RLD. And sameness in physical uh, chemical properties should be uh, established between test product and RLD. So in the next couple of slides, uh, we will focus our discussions on the uh, last requirement, uh, sameness in physical chemical uh, properties. Um, uh, let's uh, first discuss the general concepts of how comparability studies are conducted. Uh, the studies uh, should provide adequate evidences uh, supporting comparative safety and efficacy between the products. In other words, uh, the characterization should consider properties that are relevant to safety and efficacy. 
uh, based on FDA guidance, studies should be performed on the finished drug product as well as iron core carbohydrates uh, and the label iron uh, determination. Uh, we will discuss them in detail. Differences between the product uh, should be thoroughly investigated and appropriately uh, justified. If significant differences are detected and they exist in multiple properties, it may be a sign that the test product is not comparable to the reference product. In that case, uh, the applicant should consider mitigation strategies such as uh, reformulation or change of manufacturing process. Uh, when it comes to the uh, analytical methods, uh, they need to be established and validated. Uh, it is important that the methods are designed and shown to have the capacity to detect potential differences uh, in physical chemical properties between the drug products. Finally, uh, the comparability studies should demonstrate the consistency in the drug substance and drug product manufacturing processes. Uh, in general, uh, these studies uh, should be performed on batches um, that are manufactured using a process reflective of the proposed manufacturing, uh, a commercial manufacturing process, and at least one test batch uh, should be produced at the uh, commercial scale. Um, the iron uh, core drug products are complex drug products. Uh, the drug product contains inorganic iron, oxides, or oxyhydroxides, nanoparticles, as well as small molecule organic materials such as sucrose, or large molecules such as uh, semi-synthetic polysaccharides. Because of this complexity, it is desirable that not only we conduct uh, characterization studies on the finished drug product, but we also isolate the iron core and the carbohydrate and demonstrate sameness. So here in the table are examples of comparability studies and the corresponding analytical methods. Uh, they are grouped into three types of studies, uh, those for the finished drug product, uh, those for iron core, and those for uh, carbohydrate. Uh, with that, uh, let's uh, take a look at the comparability studies of the finished drug product. Uh, the goal of the studies is to demonstrate all relevant critical quality attributes found in the test products on comparable to RLD. Uh, in terms of quality considerations, um, we recommend that the applicant provide adequate characterization information for the drug substance and uh, demonstrate manufacturing process consistency. So this is usually done by testing multiple batches of drug substance, and the testing can be done by the uh, DMF holder or in-house. Uh, for drug product stoichiometric uh, characterization, uh, the applicant should provide comparative uh, information uh, for relevant components such as uh, carbon, hydrogen, iron, chlorine, sodium, uh, carbohydrate, and other organic components uh, as appropriate. Um, because of the potential interference uh, from unbound um, carbohydrates or free iron species, the firm should consider characterizing drug product prior and after the removal of interference species uh, using techniques such as uh, dialysis. If the labeling information contains dilution instructions, comparability studies under in-use conditions should be carried out and sameness under in-use conditions should be demonstrated. The next uh, consideration uh, is label ion determination. Uh, label ion species are considered uh, both uh, a quality uh, concern and a safety concern because of their implications in ion-related oxidative stress. Therefore, we ask the applicant to demonstrate that the label ion fraction uh, found in the proposed drug product is comparable to RLD. Uh, for labile ion determination, we strongly recommend that physiologically uh, relevant uh, study conditions are applied. At the bottom of these slides, I list a few literature references, including those provided in the FDA guidance. Uh, another point of consideration is that uh, the study should be designed to assess the fraction of the labile ion over time. Uh, for example, if the drug product is incubated with serum, um, label ion uh, concentrations measured at multiple time points would be desirable. Uh, the concentrations as a function of time would allow a better comparison between test products and RLD. Uh, for label ion uh, determination, we ask the stability samples are uh, used. 
uh, if dilution is allowed in labeling, uh, label out ion determination under uh, in use conditions should be carried out. Now let's turn our attention to the components of the drug product, uh, the iron core. To ensure comparability, the iron core characteristics found in the test product should be comparable to RLD. As we discussed earlier, iron core consists of uh, ferric oxyhydroxide or iron oxide networks, and they form ionic crystalline materials in the nanometer range. Characterization of iron core therefore should cover both the uh, nanomaterial characteristics such as uh, particle size and morphology, and also um, ion uh, network, ionic uh, network characteristics such as uh, a crystalline type, uh, ion environment, and uh, magnet properties. Uh, two or more complementary uh, methods based on orthogonal principles are recommended to provide uh, more detailed information. During the test, integrity and stability of the iron core should be maintained. Uh, the applicant should consider techniques uh, that require minimum sample man manipulation. If sample manipulation is unavoidable, uh, the applicant should provide detailed justifications supported by experimental data and demonstrate that such uh, manipulation would not alter the physical chemical properties of the iron core. Uh, as the last point, I would like to highlight two very useful techniques, iron uh, 57 moose power spectroscopy and TEM. Uh, both have shown great utilities in establishing sameness between the test product and the RLD uh, for iron core characterization. Uh, with this slide, uh, let's take a look at the characterization of carbohydrate. Carbohydrates are important functional components of the product uh, where they provide uh, stability and processing functions uh, during the formation of the nanomaterial. Therefore, we ask the applicant to establish carbohydrate comparability uh, between the pro, uh, pros, uh, pro, pro, proposed uh, drug product and the reference uh, product. The structure and the chemical composition of the carbohydrates must be clearly defined and compared to RLD. If there is any difference, uh, added additional information uh, should be provided to justify the sameness assessment. Uh, there are a few important scenarios um, the applicant should carefully consider. If carbohydrate shell is chemically modified, the sameness in terms of location, degree, and pattern of the modification should be demonstrated. If carbohydrate shell is a polysaccharide-based polymer, uh, the sameness in carbohydrate backbone structure and branching information should be provided. If carbohydrate shell is a mixture, um, the identity of the components and the contents of components uh, should be thoroughly characterized and the comparability uh, established. Another important factor uh, to consider uh, when we uh, assess the test product and ROD is whether they are comparable over a period of time, uh, say over the shelf life. Uh, to help us gain such information, we recommend the applicant to conduct a few stress tests to demonstrate a stability sameness. So here are uh, a few example uh, stress tests. Uh, drug product molecular weight evaluation under accelerated uh, storage conditions or stressed conditions is a great way to establish stability. Uh, SEC or size exclusion chromatography is a recommended analytical method. Uh, particle size distribution on the serial dilution is an effective way to detect nanoparticle stability and uh, agree, uh, aggregation. Uh, in vitro reductive ion release is the, uh, as a function of time uh, can provide very useful information about particle stability. And uh, finally, uh, the ion splitting pattern in moose power spectroscopy at a various temperature near the blocking temperature can provide information about the ion particle size uh, uniformity as well as uh, ion environments. Overall, these uh, techniques have shown great utilities in detecting sameness and difference between drug products. And if they are used uh, to uh, assess the different batches, then they can also provide information about the consistency of the uh, manufacturing processes.
This slide uh, provides some additional considerations uh, for comparability studies uh, to establish sameness. Uh, the first bullet point addresses the requirements uh, for analytical method procedure. Uh, we recommend uh, the applicant to use identical sample treatment procedures for test and ROD analysis. Uh, whenever applicable, uh, the analytical method should be validated and calibrated, uh, and reference uh, standard information should be provided, and sample age should be identified for all studies. To minimize the variability, a statistically meaningful sample size should be considered whenever possible. If the study is designed to characterize the properties of the finished drug product, uh, sample manipulation should be kept at the minimum. If it is not feasible without sample manipulation, justification should be provided. Finally, uh, just to re-emphasize, uh, multiple product batches should be used to uh, conduct the comparability studies. All testing batches should be manufactured using a process reflective of the proposed commercial manufacturing process. And at least one test batch should be produced at uh, the commercial scale. So with that, uh, let's uh, summarize today's discussions. Uh, comparability studies need to be conducted in order to establish sameness between the test and RLD iron core drug products. Assessments need to be performed on drug product, iron core, carbohydrates, and the labor iron de determination. In addition to the characterization studies conducted under normal conditions, stress test studies of test and RLD products uh, can be used to further demonstrate sameness. Okay, now uh, let's use what we have learned to answer a couple of challenge questions. Uh, challenge question number one, how many generic iron colloid drug products have been approved for the treatment of iron deficiency anemia? The answers are A, zero, B, one, C, two, or D, three. So how many generic iron colloid drug products have been approved for the treatment of iron deficiency anemia? And the answer is C, two. Currently, there are two approved generic iron colloid drug products, uh, sodium ferric gluconate injection and also generic uh, ferromoxetol injection. Challenge question number two, which of the following statements is not true? A. Iron colloid drug products contain nano-sized colloidal particles. B, the proposed parental uh, drug product should be qual qualitatively and quantitatively the same as reference list drug. C, comprehensive side-by-side -side studies need to be performed on drug product, iron core, carbohydrate, and labor iron determination. And D, for one-time physical chemical characterization studies, detailed analytical method validation information, instruct, uh, instrument calibration information, as well as reference standard information are not needed. So which of the following statements is not true? The answer is D. So if the physical chemical char uh, characterization studies are used for comparability uh, purpose, uh, even if it is a one-time study, uh, we still uh, request detailed analytical method validation information, uh, instrument calibration information, as well as reference standard information. So that's the end of my uh, today's presentation. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. My presentation today is injectable suspension, tools and methods bridging the in vivo and in vitro gap. Here are the learning objectives for this presentation. First, I will talk about bioequivalent approaches for injectable suspension products. Next, I will talk about the pathways to discuss alternative B approaches with the agency. Finally, I will provide a summary of Gudupa research on injectable suspension products.
Injectable suspension is a type of dosage form that consists of solid drug particles of nano or micro size range that are suspended in aqueous vehicles. It has been used for a variety of parental route of administration for different indications. And it has been developed as powders for injection or ready to use suspension. In general, uh, injectable suspension products offers uh, different levels of sustained release. This is mainly controlled by the water solubility and the particle size of the drug substance. To demonstrate the equivalence of an injectable suspension to the RD, a generic drug product needs to have the same active ingredient, strength, dosage form, and route of administration, condition of use, and labeling to the RD. A generic drug product needs to be Q1 and Q2 the same in terms of inactive ingredients as the RRD. In addition, a generic job product needs to be, uh, need to demonstrate its bioequivalent to the RRD. There are different types of B studies, in vitro B studies and in vivo B studies. In vivo B studies contain B studies with PK endpoints B studies with PD endpoints and B studies with clinical endpoints. A B study needs to be sensitive, accurate, and reproducible. In general, a B study with PK endpoint is recommended in product specific guidance for systemically acting injectable suspensions products. This include uh, injectable suspension products for short term use and uh, long acting injectable suspension products for chronic use. For some of the injectable suspension products for short-term use, FDA has also recommend in vitro option in the product specific guidance. This uh, one example is uh, product specific guidance on chamcinolone acetonide injectable suspension. One question is that why the product specific guidance on long-acting injectable suspension do not have in vitro only approaches. From formulation perspective, long acting injectable suspension and injectable suspension for short term use, they have many similarity. For example, the drug substance is the only insoluble components and the drug release is mainly driven by the dissolution of drug substance particle. However, uh, if we consider other factor, for example, the prolonged application duration and indication, uh, long acting suspension product presents a higher risk of clinical failure compared to uh, product for short term use. So to develop an in vitro alternative B approach for long acting suspension products, sufficient understanding on critical formulation characteristics and their impact on product in vivo performance needs to be obtained. An applicant needs to understand which factors cause in vivo variability, physiological factors or formulation factors. An applicant need to conduct failure mode analysis to better understand the key parameters that are responsible for product performance. In addition, the applicant need to demonstrate how the proposed physical chemical categorization studies correlate to uh, critical quality attributes and in vitro in vivo drug release of the drug products. Need to provide information on design space of critical quality attributes. In vitro in vivo correlation can be helpful to support in vitro only approach, but establishing in vitro in vivo correlation may not be less challenging than the current PSG recommended study for such type of product.
the PSG recommendation uh, is non-binding. OGD is open to novel alternative B approaches for assessing bioequivalence. There are two pathways to discuss with the agency for an alternative B approach. First one is using control correspondences. The other one is using pre anti meeting request. Please refer to these two guidance for industry for more detailed information. If you would like to propose a third DP approach, please make sure you provide sufficient information and data to support your proposal. Now let's switch gear to Gadufa research on injectable suspension products. The model job used in this project is Champsinolol acetona injectable suspension. It has been reported that uh, following intramuscular injection of Champsinolol injectable suspension, the Tmax vary from one hour to several hundred hours, and the Cmax exhibit variance between 50 to 100 percent. This type of variability has not been reported to other Champsinolol dosage forms. So the variability is not likely due to the deposition of chamsinolol itself. This research was conducted to explore the potential cause of in vivo PK variability from formulation physical chemical property perspective. Suspension are often designed to weakly flocculate to maintain the long-term product physical stability. When flocculates sediment, the loose network of flocculate maintain particle to particle distance in the sediment to prevent irreversible particle aggregation. Flocculate particles do not form a cake, are uh, easily uh, be resuspended. Flocculation can be controlled by the use of wetting agent, polymeric excipients, or control the environmental conditions such as pH in ironic strengths. Chamsinolone acetone injectable suspension is a flocculated uh, suspension formulation. As shown in uh, this polarized light microscopy image of chamsinolone acetone injectable suspension, it contains primary particles of 1 to 4 micron and secondary flocculates of tens of micron. For flocculated suspension, shear has a direct impact on the particle sizes. Shear can be introduced to a system mechanically through the use of stirring or sonication. The impact of stirring rate on particle size is shown here. With increased stirring rate of the laser diffraction system, the peak max of particle decreased and the particle population at 1 to 2 micron increased. This was attributed to the deflocculated primary particles. Increasing sonication time, the particle size shifted to the left and become broader. The reversible flocculation of chamsinolone suspension was also studied by monitoring the changes in particle size with or without sonication. When the sonication was discontinued, the particle size began to flocculate with particle D90 increase by 50% or more over 10 minutes. Following intramuscular injection in vivo dissolution takes place under highly non-sync conditions due to limited perfusion in injection site. A non-sync dissolution method therefore was developed to uh, further study the role of deflocculation on drug dissolution. The setup of dissolution study is shown on the uh, bottom right figure. This setup contains a laser diffraction flow cell dispersion unit with in situ fiber optic UVB probe. This setup is capable to simultaneously monitor the drug 
particle size and dissolution. To study the role of deflagration on drug dissolution, two sample introduction methods are used here. A high uh, shear method using syringe fitting a 25 gauge needle was used. The second method is a low shear method using micro pipette. The syringe method was used here to mimic the shear conditions of intramuscular dry injection in patients. In this case, a changes in needle gouge or injection rate may change the flocculate states of the suspension, so the particle size of injected drug can be changed, thus affecting the bioavailability of the drug product. The dissolution profiles of suspension introduced by two different methods, high shear and low shear methods, is shown in this figure. Suspension uh, exhibit faster dissolution when introduced through a 25 gauge needle compared to a micro pipette. The initial rate of dissolution, uh, the initial rate of dissolution of high shear methods by 25 uh, gauge needle is about four to five times to that of the low shear method, which is introduced by micro pipette. This result shows the shear during administration or sample introduction can significantly impact the dissolution rate of the drug product. The particle size and concentration of particles were also captured in the dissolution study. The magnitude of change in particle size during dissolution was greater for sample introduced by, by the lower uh, shear methods. In contrast, the changes in particle concentration as measured by percentage light obscuration were more uh, evident for the light uh, shear syringe in introduction methods. So this difference in trend uh, in the particle size and particle concentration indicate the flocculated and deflocculated particles can have different dissolution mechanisms. It seems that for deflocculated particles, the dissolution uh, consists dissolving into smaller particles and reforming flocculates. This results in a consistent particle size, but reduction in particle concentration. On the other hand, the dissolution pathway for flocculates seems to mainly by slow erosion of the flocculate. This slide provides a summary of the Godufa research I just mentioned. Uh, Chamsino acetone injectable suspension contain uh, two types of particles, primary particle of several microns and secondary flocculates of tens of microns. The conversion between the flocculated and deflocculated particles was very fast, reversible, and highly shear dependent. Changing the shear rate during laser diffraction by different uh, stirring rates or sonication may result in variability in particle size distribution. A non-sync discriminative dissolution method was developed to simultaneously monitor dissolution and change of particle size distribution. Shear during administration or sample introduction significantly impact the dissolution rate of the drug product. In summary, um, a bioequivalent study needs to be accurate, sensitive, and reproducible. The prolonged duration of use and indication for long-acting injectable suspension products present a higher risk of clinical failure compared to injectable suspension of short-term use. To develop an in vitro approach for long-acting injectable suspension products, we need to obtain sufficient understanding on critical formulation characteristics and their impact on the product on in vivo performance. Godufa research have improved the stand understanding on how uh, flocculation properties of injectable suspensions impact product categorization, dissolution profiles, and potential uh, PK properties.
This is uh, challenge question number one. Which of the following bivalent approach is currently recommended in a PSG on long-acting systemic injectable suspension that has potential safety concerns? A. Bio waiver. B. In vitro approach. C. In vivo PK study. D. B and C. For those who select in vivo PK study, C, you are right. Challenge question number two. Which of the following pathway can be used to get OGDs common on the alternative B approach? A, control correspondence. B, free end of product development meeting. C, A and B. D, pre IND meeting. For those who select uh, answer C, great job. With that, I would like to uh, thank to all my colleagues, uh, including Yan Wang, Kobe Tabi Kozak, Xiaoming Xu, William Smith, Zhong Limbat, Ying Zhang, Muhammad, Ashrash. Thank you for your attention. If you have any question, I will be happy to answer your question in the panel discussion session. Thank you. Thank you to all of our presenters for your great presentations. We'll now enter into our Q&A panel comprising of our session speakers and introducing Dr. Bruce Lerman. He's currently a lead pharmacologist in the Division of Bioequivalence One in the Office of Bioequivalence. Dr. Lerman leads a team of pharmacologists assessing bioequivalence on a wide array of generic drug products. One area of focus for Dr. Lerman is the assessment of iron colloidal products, including being part of a multidisciplinary team involved in developing the product-specific guidance for generic drugs referencing venifer injection. Dr. Lerman also serves on the Narrow Therapeutic Index Working Group within OGD. And we also welcome Dr. Darby Kozak, who's the Deputy Director for the Division of Therapeutic Performance One and FDA's Office of Generic Drugs. Dr. Kozak leads a group of interdisciplinary scientists on the development of new analytical methods and equivalence evaluation methodologies for complex drug substances and parenteral ophthalmic anodic formulations. We now have questions coming in. The first group of questions will be directed to Dr. Zhang. And here's a question for Dr. Zhang, the first one. Regarding your great presentation on complex topic describing all the iron species, you noted iron sucrose as an example of a colloidal iron product with a PSG. There are PSGs for other iron complexes, but the BE criteria differs. Is there an intent to harmonize the recommendations, or are the recommendations dependent upon the strength of the iron binding capacity. Yeah, thank you for the great question. Uh, you think ahead, so you get yourself prepared. Actually, um, uh, we are planning to revise some other iron complex products, uh, product specific guidance. Actually, you can find more information at the FDA's uh, product specific guidance website. Uh, we have a forecast page uh, listing upcoming planned revised PSG for complex generic drug products. Actually, uh, this page was updated uh, on August 20th, uh, 2021. Um, uh, the 
iron dextrin, uh, sodium ferricoglucanate, uh, their uh, PSG will be revised. Um, actually, on this uh, forecast page, uh, we also noted uh, what will be revised. For example, like minor revision uh, about uh, uh, the uh, drug name and also uh, provide more details on product characterization and additional uh, in vivo study design uh, options. Thank you for responding to that question. We have another question for Dr. Zhang. And here's the question. The intra-subject variability of the PK parameters presented is surprisingly very low compared to the studies we have conducted in the past. Did you compare the ratio of the 90% confidence interval of the subtraction to TBI with TI as it regards to Cmax and AUC 0 to 48 and what were the results? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, uh, we understand like um, some analytical methods may uh, produce higher uh, variability uh, for some of the species measured, like uh, the TBI, T, uh, TI. Uh, but please note, this is a kind of new bar analytical method. Uh, I'm not sure like uh, which um, bar analytical method you have been using. We did observe some like uh, higher variability for the non-transferring bound iron, like the citrate iron. If you look at the CV, it's quite high. And uh, uh, but for other species, I think uh, the uh, within subject, but here I also want to clarify, uh, this is not a fully crossover study, so we are not really getting the true uh, within subject variability. This is like an estimate. Uh, the within subject variability uh, estimated is relatively low. Yeah, I think uh, uh, this data uh, were not published yet, and uh, uh, the team is still working on the manuscript preparation. So you probably will get more details about uh, the study results. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We have one last question for Dr. Zhang in this round, and here's the question. Please clarify why some PSGs require enrollment of healthy subjects while other patients uh, do not, such as the uh, iron sucrose versus iron dextran or ferric carboxy maltose. Does that have to do with the availability of data generated on healthy subjects by the originator or is the decision based on TSAT levels at the selected dose? I believe for uh, sodium ferricum glucanate, the iron sucrose, uh, iron dextrin, we all recommended uh, the healthy subjects. Uh, I, I think uh, which population to select, either a healthy subject or patients, really depending on like uh, whether uh, there is any safety concern or tolerability concern uh, when the drug product is administered to healthy subjects. Uh, I, I believe for this, uh, uh, most of these iron compass products, we recommended uh, healthy subjects in the PSG. Thank you for responding to that question. The next few questions will go to Dr. Lee. And here's the first question. In your presentation, you mentioned that analytical methods need to be validated to determine differences and physical chemical properties. Please explain in more detail which analytical methods are related to validation, quality or structure related methods like most Bauer spectroscopy, ESR, and TEM. Thank you for the question. Um, 
Yeah, as uh, the question asked, um, you know, some of the method obviously um, are not commonly used in pharmaceutical industry. Uh, they are more suitable for the research field. Uh, however, for the assignment uh, studies, uh, we still recommend that those uh, uh, methods are, uh, at least uh, has to demonstrate the suitability to use um, for the comparability studies. So in terms of the parameters, uh, um, we can recommend, uh, obviously, the precisions, uh, robustness, and intermediate precisions. And those will be the, uh, the parameters that, uh, as appropriate, uh, can be used to demonstrate the suitability. Um, and also, uh, because those uh, methods, like I said, are not commonly used, so that's uh, perhaps one of the other reasons why we ask orthogonal methods uh, as a way to establish sameness, so that uh, although maybe one method, uh, you know, you do have a, a few variabilities here and there, uh, but if you use the orthogonal method, you will have a better, uh, more confidence uh, in terms of the, um, the establishment of the sameness. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question for Dr. Lee. In your presentation, uh, sorry, I, I reread the wrong question. Here we are, the next one. Regarding comparative stress test studies, you've mentioned some examples of stress tests on slide 15. What other conditions do you consider to be stress conditions? Um. Well, obviously, stress conditions, um, you know, time, temperature would be considered stress conditions, right? So, I mean, pretty much every method if you use, uh, you can apply those. So, I mean, those are the, um, so far, however, I mean, what we have noticed so far has been that uh, uh, looks like the uh, molecular weight, so using uh, SEC methods or the particle size distribution and in vitro release, uh, those uh, um, I think parameters are, are very sensitive uh, towards uh, the stress testing. So if you do that, then you, uh, you know, if, the, if the, uh, the drug products are not uh, similar to each other or not uh, comparable to each other, you, you can uh, quickly see and uh, uh, you know, the stabilities. Um, obviously the firm can uh, propose additional stress tests uh, as you see appropriate um, for those, uh, the other uh, tests then obviously they propose with justifications. And um, I think that another reason that we uh, uh, highlight uh, the molecular weight, the particle size, and the in vitro release is because they are easier to perform, right? So compared to other methods, uh, perhaps uh, uh, require more specific uh, conditions, and for those, it's easier. So that's uh, perhaps the other reason that we uh, recommend those. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We have one last question for Dr. Lee in this round, and here's the question. Can you please elaborate on what methods can be used to quantify in vitro reductive release over time? Um, thank you for that question. Um, I don't think we have a really a preferred or a preference in terms of which method you use to uh, conduct in vitro uh, release testing. Obviously, there are literatures out there, you know, discussing different uh, methods and different approaches. And of course, the firm itself can establish its own methods. Uh, what we would like to, I guess, recommend is that for whichever the method that been used, uh, um, obviously the uh, applicant should establish the suitability, right? the suitability for the intended use, and then the method has to be validated. Um, you know, like I just mentioned, you know, you have to have a precision, you have to have a robustness, and you know, pre and, and also uh, accuracy, and so on and so forth. And then uh, perhaps the additional. Uh, Perhaps the things that we we'll look for is uh, whether this uh, method can show the ability to detect difference, right? So not only just the other comparable, but also if they are not comparable, can you tell them? So that um, those uh, things need to be established uh, or demonstrated before you go on and test the method. Thank you. I mean, test the product, I'm sorry. Thank you for responding to those questions. The next group of questions will be directed to Dr. Chen. And here's the first question. The paliperidone palmitate 3MPSG suggests that extrapolation from 1M formulation is adequate. Is this true or is this a misunderstanding of the guidance? 
Thank you for the question. Um, I'm not sure um, what you mean by uh, extrapolation. Uh, the current product specific guidance for the uh, three months polyperidone palmitate uh, in, in injectable suspension products allow using a uh, patient who receive one month uh, polyperidone palmitate injection um, uh, to be as um, subject. However, um, you still need to uh, uh, administer your either your test products or the reference product to achieve a uh, steady state prior to the uh, PK measurement. Uh, if, if your the interpolation, what you mean is that whether we can use the result of B study from the one month products to 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 support uh, the bioequivalence of the three month products. This is not what the guidance suggested. This, the guidance does not uh, convey this information. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question, and this is referring to slide 13. What is the dissolution medium in this case? Uh, in slide uh, 13, the dissolution medium uh, used for the study is uh, DI water. Uh, if you would like to get uh, more detailed information about the uh, 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 in vitro uh, release testing setup and uh, experimental condition, uh, I would uh, recommend you uh, take a look at uh, our publication. Um, all, all the uh, study I present in this presentation has been published. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We have another question for Dr. Chen, and here's the question. What is the main reason to select non-sync condition? Is there any impact if we can select sync conditions methods referencing USP4? Thank you for the question. Um, yeah. As I mentioned in the presentation, um, a non-sync condition was selected because um, this can better mimic the condition at the site of uh, intramuscular injection. And also, um, the IVIT method developed based on non-sync condition can provide um, better discriminative power for drug release of uh, flocculated particles versus deflocculated particles. Uh, so you, you mentioned uh, the USP4. Um, in general, uh, USP4 um, method, it's, it's good for um, non-flocculated uh, suspension products. However, uh, because using uh, USP4, uh, the dissolution media need to pass through the, uh, uh, the space in the packing material. So that actually, uh, uh, when when the flow flu um, cross those uh, material that has relative high shear, so uh, US, the drawback of USP four uh, is that you cannot control the shear. However, uh, as we know, for flocculated uh, suspension, uh, shear is very important in terms of particle size and drug release. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. The next group of questions will be directed doc to Dr. Lerman. And here's the first question. It's rather long, so uh, bear with me while I read it out. When validating an in vitro method for use during a pivotal bioequivalent study that has been recommended by the agency in a product-specific guidance, should the applicant use the RLD or test product to validate the particle size distribution method for use in the in vitro pivotal BE study? Except for the particle size distribution method, does the agency recommend using the RLD or test product to conduct the validation for any other in vitro method?
Thanks, Ray, uh, and thanks for that question. Um, so to, to answer uh, the first part of your question, um, at least for particle size distribution method validation, we would recommend um, that you do use the reference or the RLD product to conduct the validation. Uh, there are, uh, there's one exception uh, specifically, um, as I know that the PSG for Venifer probably mentioned or does mention that for the dilution uh, validation, uh, we would want the method validated using both the RLD and the test product. Um, and I think, you know, like I mentioned that that is, um, that is indicated in the product specific guidance. Um, related to your second question, where you say, does the agency recommend um, the test or the RLD for other in vitro methods? Um, I think there are some exceptions. I know that for in vitro release testing that we, we do accept validation data using the test product. Uh, so that would be one exception to the rule, but generally it's the um, reference to R or the RLD product that we prefer be used for validation. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We have another question for Dr. Lerman, and here's the question. Can you provide some explanation as to why Z-average and polydispersity index were added as BE parameters for the particle size distribution study in the updated PSG referencing Venifor, Venifer. Yes, uh, thanks for that question. So yeah, for the for purposes of demonstrating uh, BE, at least for the product specific gui guidance is referencing uh, Venifer and I, I believe uh, Ferric uh, Kaboxy Maltose, Z average and polydispersity index um, were added as BE parameters for the pivotal um, uh, particle distribution study. Um, so uh, this stems from um, the instrumental recommendations and method standards uh, for studies using dynamic light scattering uh, to measure particle size. Um, the Z average and the polydispersity um, index measurements are uh, compared to something like D50 or SPAN uh, are considered to be more reliable reporting measures. And so um, I believe, you know, it's ASTM and the ISO standards um, make recommendations that for nanoparticles less than 100 nanometers in suspensions, that Z average and polydispersity index uh, are, are more reliable measures uh, for average particle size. Um, so therefore, um, it's our expectation that bioequivalence be based on that bioequivalence that is based on, or or if the D50 and span measurements uh, are provided, that they be supported uh, by Z average and polydispersity index measurements as well. Um, and that's you know, and that's if you're using dynamic light scattering uh, to measure the particle size. Um, also, I should note uh, that we do recommend that you report all your method validation data in terms of uh, Z average and polydispersity index and provide uh, acceptance criteria uh, for the same. Thanks. Thanks for responding to that question. For the last co question, it looks like we have just a few minutes left. We'll bring in Dr. Kozak for the last question. And here's the question. What is the agency's stand on the API definition of iron colloid products besides venifer, iron dextran, and ferlicet, also noted as sodium ferric gluconate. Thanks. Um, I think as uh, Dr. Zhang and Dr. Lee highlighted in their talks, as part of the response to the recent citizen petition in uh, 2021 in May, uh, a number of these products um, were revised in terms of what the active ingredient name was and, and will be. Um, and those were in particular the ones that were highlighted here, the iron sucrose, iron dextran, and sodium ferric gluconate. And those are now all being termed or considered uh, ferric oxyhydroxide. In the response to the citizen petition, which I definitely recommend everyone read that's in this area to get the sort of overall rationale and thinking and also which products would be affected, um, the FDA also identified those products that would be applicable for this and so updated the orange book accordingly. And so those products that are affected are actually already updated in the orange book. 
And as part of it, we're also working internally and with the external stakeholders to update labeling and things like that for those products. The other products which remain, things like ferric carboxymaltose, ferromoxitol, ferric citrate, those items will stay the same as the active ingredient and weren't affected by this overall decision. So hopefully that's helpful. And I definitely recommend, like I said, is to, to read that citizen petition if you are working in this area. Thanks. Thanks for responding to that questions. And thank you to all of our presenters. We're just about all in time on our third Q&A panel. We'd like to thank all of our presenters and panelists for answering numerous questions that came in. We'll now transition